Great. We're recording now. Welcome, everybody. If you're just joining, there's a few more people coming in, I could see, but let's get started. Go to the next slide, Barbara. There we go. I'm Amy Evans Godwin, and I'm from ISME, and I help facilitate the Go Open National Network, which has been a community led K-12 affiliation with, uh, with ISME and its partners over the last two years. And uh, you're probably familiar with Go Open that for six years or so is a federal initiative. And over the last two years, it's been a community led, -led effort, especially around K-12 practice and policy. And for the last year, 2023, we're really proud of the the professional learning webinar series we've been doing. And this is part of that. So, so excited to have Washington OSPI team with us and the focus on climate science learning and open educational resources development today. So I'll hand it to Barbara to take us and team to take us through this um, great subject. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, just a quick round of introductions here. Uh, my name is Barbara Suits. I am the Open Educational Resources and Instructional Materials Program Manager here at OSPI. And I will pass it over to Elizabeth to kick us off. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Schmidt. I am the Environmental and Sustainability Education Program Supervisor in the elementary team. My subject area covers K-12. Lori. Hi everybody, my name is Lori Henriksen and I am uh, the Climate Science Curriculum Integration Consultant. And I do wanna throw out that Washington was the first state to have someone specifically in climate science education at their uh, State Department of Ed. So uh, exciting for us and I love working with the team and I'm gonna throw it to Kimberly. Hello everyone, my name is Kimberly Astle and I am the Associate Director over Elementary Science and Content Integration. I'll pass it over to Johanna. Yeah, hello everyone, Johanna Brown. I'm the Associate Director of Secondary Science and uh, we're gonna move into our land acknowledgement and we're really excited to share about climb time. So um, <clears throat> this proviso that we have is, is um, has had things added to it over the years, including being really thoughtful about tribal schools in our state and about how we think about indigenous ways of knowing. Um, and our agency is also kind of going through this question of, are we doing land acknowledgements as sort of this perfunctory or performative idea? And so in, in thinking about that, since we're all in different places, I just wanted to share a resource with everyone to kind of help us just be thoughtful um, about, about teaching and about indigenous peoples. And so um, I don't know if anyone has seen before, but STEM teaching tools are, are open access resources um, developed out of the University of Washington that while they say STEM, um, they really are incredibly expansive and they're these great one to two page briefs. So for this one, um, it's really about thinking about indigenous ways of knowing and traditional classrooms and how typically those have been in opposition to each other, especially when we think about Western science. So if you check out this brief, um, there are tons of links in there and they have information for teachers and for district level for anyone supporting teachers, teachers in professional learning. So this is something that we try to bring into our climb time work and our OER work. So there's a link for you there. So, oh, and maybe oh, did this I jump? There we go. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So I've said climb time already quite a few times, but haven't really explained what it is. So in 2018, um, the Washington State Legislature passed funding. Um, they passed $3 million to support climate science learning. And also that's connected to science learning, right? To implementation of the next generation science standards. And it's really all about professional learning. They've continued to fund it for five years. We're now in our sixth year. And um, something that's really incredible for this is that the money didn't just come to us at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. It came to us to then support 
other organizations. So community-based organizations, also educational service districts, and it's created this network. Um, oh, and we also have some tribal schools. So I think that got added in 2020 or 2021, um, where we directly funded tribal schools to build upon this work. Um, so they're all developing independently and sometimes in collaboration, science and climate science education initiatives that support the professional learning of teachers. So on the next slide, You'll just see, and I think this is a big part of the work we want to share today, is that across the state, we're trying to bring together people and resources from all of these different organizations to join in on this effort. And that's what we love about using this OER setup is they can all submit it. We get to read it. It's there in one place for all of our educators. So I just wanted this slide to kind of go, wow, look at all of those groups being part of this effort to bring more resources um, to a space where teachers really need it in climate education. Okay, And then just kind of our why is we, we're in a climate crisis. And um, as, as a state agency, we have climate and, and as a state, our governor um, really supports climate integration. And so that's a priority that we have in addition to building a statewide network, supporting students traditionally underserved by science education, one of our goals is to have useful and quality resources. Then we want to have great connections for teachers. Um, and so just out of the climate work, there's a quote down here that I think is really common from educators who, um, who engage with us. So they saw climate change as a huge overwhelming issue as well as a very political one. And they didn't really feel prepared or knowledgeable, but they feel really different now. And this is a fourth grade teacher now having access to resources and some great professional learning. It's feeling like I can do this. So um, that's one of our goals for getting these resources out. And I will uh, I will pick it up from there. So um, one of the things that I'm really proud about are about our agency, our Washington State Department of, of Education, or the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, is that we have uh, an open licensee policy with our agency, which basically says that every uh, contractor or staff member or grantee that receives money um, to produce resources uh, actually has to commit to having those those resources openly licensed. So um, this is definitely the case with all of our climb time grants. Um, grantees, when they receive funding, have to um, assure that the materials that they create will be openly licensed, that they'll also be ADA compliant, and that they will be shared via our Washington OER hub. And I mentioned our Washington OER Hub. Some of you may be familiar with this, but our uh, our Washington OER Hub is our online library for uh, sharing educational resources that are either created by our Washington educators or curated for them. And this is really an opportunity for us to share great grant funded work uh, with a much larger audience. It is, uh, we originally started our hub um, and our hub, I should say, is a smaller subset of the larger OER Commons platform. And this site was originally dedicated to just what I said, sharing grant resources that had been created by um, folks that were doing work in Washington State. When the pandemic hit, we kind of uh, opened the uh, the sandbox a little bit more, and we started curating a few more resources as well from external sites. So today you'll see a mix of, of both of those on our site. I will not play it now, but if you're interested, there is a brief overview of the Washington Hub that's linked in the slide deck. And I also have a one-page handout that I think Amy um, you'll have in a, a shared folder, or I can put the link to that um, in here as well. There are a number of different pathways by which resources make our, their way onto our Washington Hub. Um, the first is existing um, OSPI material that's been legislatively mandated. So for instance, our since time in memori memorial tribal sovereignty curriculum is, is one that would fall into that category. Um, the second way is our external partners. We work with different state organizations. Um, we also collaborate with expert educators from across the state, um, offering small contracts uh, to create materials. 
I mentioned that we've recently started curating some third party resources. Um, but the one that Climb Time falls under and probably the bulk of the resources that we have on there are generated through um, small seed grants that go out to districts and nonprofit organizations around the state. Sometimes it happens that there's a really lovely synergy that happens between these different um, methods of getting resources on there. Um, for instance, we worked with our external partner, um, the Washington League of Women Voters to openly license their textbook. Um, we were able to give grants to school districts who translated into Spanish and Japanese. Um, and we also collaborated with educators to create inquiry-based assignments um, that tied in with civics and with climate science to create um, activities that go along with the work. So it's a, it's a nice way to lend additional life to resources. All of the resources that are submitted to our Washington Hub um, meet these criteria. They're all aligned with Washington learning standards. Um, in the case of our climate science resources, these are all aligned to NGSS. They all have clear learning objectives and goals. They're certainly accurate, relevant, and up to date. Um, we make sure that they're developmentally and culturally appropriate and support sound teaching practices. And these are guidelines that are given to all our grantees so that they know when they submit resources um, that this is the expectation for all materials that go on the site. We are able to contract with expert educators around the state to then do a, a deeper dive into the materials um, that our grantees create. And we use a couple of different rubrics for that. Um, the first is our quality review rubric for lessons and units. And this is an agnostic tool um, that is just a, a, a good review for high quality instructional materials. But in this particular case for our climb time work, we actually lean a little bit more heavily into the NGSS lesson screener because there is some very specific um, content based uh, review information that is ensuring that the materials align to the three dimensions of NGSS. We also have a screening for biased content and instructional materials that our reviewers take a look at. And all of those are linked both in the slide deck and in the one pager that I will put in the chat here shortly. I will jump to our Washington Hub really quickly just to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, where to find the climb time resources that we're going to be talking about uh, during the rest of the presentation. So cross your fingers. I've done a live link to the Washington OER Hub, so um, we're going to hope everything runs smoothly here. When you get onto our hub, probably the easiest way to find the climb time resources is, if you know the name, just to type it into the, uh, the search window here, or you could just type in climb time, and that will bring up those resources as well. If you are interested in taking a look at some of the most recent resources that have been added, you have the ability to sort by date added. And you could see what the most current resources that our grantees have uh, submitted to the system are. And my computer evidently needs a little bit of coffee. It's a slow slog here. I'm going to give it like one more second, and then I'm going to give up on that one. There we go. Uh, so you can see that there are some primary resources that have been added, as well as a professional learning opportunity for uh, grade three to five educators. Um, and this one is a, a really robust set of teacher guidance and uh, lessons that have been included. The other way that you can find all of the Climb Time resources is just going to the Climb Time group itself. So if I click on groups, you'll notice that there are a couple of tabs on the top. One are all of the OSPI administered content areas, but the second one is our OSPI grantees and collaborators tab. And on the front row, you will find climb time. 
And if you dive into that climb time group, you'll notice that on the left hand side, all of the resources are categorized by either their particular grade band or if they are professional learning resources or resource development guidance resources are available as well. Pinned to the top, you will find the Climb Time Resource Portal. This is a one pager, actually it's two pages, uh, that can be downloaded and it links to all of those, uh, those different grade bands as well. So I am going to leave the site and jump back to our presentation, and I will actually turn it over to Elizabeth to uh, give us a little bit more detail about some of the resources on Climb Time. Thanks so much. So you can see here a screenshot where up in the top row we have Climb Time, and then I've highlighted an, an additional channel, Washington Environmental Education. The reason I did that is because one of our longtime Climb Time partners, EarthGen, um, has also been awarded additional funding through a line item budget proviso to provide bilingual environmental education resources. So one thing that we found through our Climb Time work was that we needed a, a really a community of practice that was cohort based for our grantees to engage in meaningful professional learning that would help ensure we had this cohesive statewide vision and implementation. And so through the process of multiple years of iterating on our knowledge and our resource development, um, EarthGen has secured this additional funding and developed these additional resources. So even though they're not in our climb time collection, we wanted to share them with you as an example of something that has really emerged from the climb time effort, even though it's in a different collection. So. Sorry, I just muted myself. So the link to the environmental education collection is here in the chat. Um, and moving to the next slide, you can see that this is an elementary level unit that is focused on um, really environmental and sustainability education standards, science standards, and social emotional learning standards. And they're integrated in that way. So this unit has a suite of interactive activities that are guided by a framework for culturally sustaining pedagogy. And there are opportunities embedded throughout to develop English language art skills in support of um, multilingual learners in particular. So if you click on the um, Monarch Mystery resource, it will bring you to this page. And so from here, you can access the overview and you can see this kind of suite of resources that is on the right hand side, which has all the materials that any educator might need to successfully implement this unit of study. Go ahead. So then if you scroll down on the page, you can learn a little bit more about the um, kind of the focus of this unit of study. So the it's a it's ideally situated for younger learners, early elementary, so K2. It's really truly grounded in local phenomenon. Um, and it's shared through the eyes of Violetta, who is a young girl from a migrant community in central Washington. And so one thing we find in this unit, and we can go ahead and switch to the next slide. There we go. Is that it has these elements of highlighting local phenomena, uh, this is aligned to WIDA standards, and WIDA standards are the standards that are uh, essentially designed to support emergent multilingual learners in their language development. And then um, it engages with storytelling as a culturally relevant tool. It supports community connections for family and community engagement. And then it provides, you can see in this bottom half of the screen share or screen capture, um, there's this suggested framework. So there's a guiding question. There are connections to the phenomenon be, via a shared reading, um, some primary activities, and then extension activities, along with a prompt for sketching and journaling. Next slide. Oh, sorry. If you can go back one. Um, I was going to share a little bit about Violetta's story. And so, um, 
I'm going to just read a little bit of it to you, if I could. I forgot to start my timer. How much time do I have, Kimberly? I think I'm almost out of time. Um, okay. I'm sorry, so, Elizabeth. You've got a couple minutes. Go for okay. it. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so modern mystery is grounded in a local phenomenon about migrating. Oh, sorry. I'm reading the wrong side. Sorry. Bear with me. I'm trying to move my things around. Okay. So here is Violetta's story. And um, Violetta's story is also available in both English and Spanish. So something we found is that we do have a strong community of Spanish speakers in Washington state and a strong support from our superintendent to provide Spanish instruction in dual language uh, schools. And so all of these resources are available both fully in English and in Spanish. So Violetta is a young girl living in the community of Natchez, Washington, her Natchez, Washington. Her family is her mother, Maria, her father, Miguel, and her younger brother, Victor. Violetta's parents are farm workers from a small town in Mexico, Santa Cruz de la Ricon. They have moved many times since coming to the United States, but through every move, they've had each other and many new and old family members along the way. Violetta loves being outdoors. Her family values the environment and sharing knowledge. Violetta is often looking closely at plants and animals wherever she goes. She's very curious and loves to learn. And this is why she carries her handy notebook and pencil wherever she goes. So just through this story, you can get the idea that it is situated in local context. It provides connections to individual and cultural experiences and values. And it sets the stage for what students might experience during the lesson or the unit. It goes on to talk about her experience with butterfly, monarch butterflies in her home country and she goes looking for those monarch butterflies in her new community garden, um, in her new neighborhood. And so it's a it's a story of exploration that connects directly to standards-based learning around making observations, asking questions, designing and conducting investigations. Um, and then I think lastly, I just wanted to share that um, the guidance for educators document that's at the top of the kind of list of materials available for this unit really provides a layout. It, it provides the full unit of study. It's got about 13 lessons to it. Each lesson has, um, you know, everything a teacher would need to run and implement the lesson. And then EarthGen also does provide um, individual instruction for educators or schools or districts who are interested in doing this kind of work, as do many of our other organizations across Washington State. And I will pass the mic over to Kimberly. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. So we're really thinking about equitable access to instructional materials in our state. And in elementary, we know that about 25% of our teachers have no materials to teach science with. Um, and so we embarked on this project to look for and curate freely available materials that we could then make available through this our lovely WAOER. And so we, um, I worked with teachers in our state and so we curated activities, lessons, units, ebooks, articles, podcasts, videos for each of our science standards for grades K-5. And in elementary, we don't have a lot of very specific climate change standards in elementary, but our students are learning many different foundational science ideas that support them when they get to understanding things like climate change in later grades. Um, and so this resource, um, we've shared this, this with teachers across our state, with our, our climb tie partners, and we've seen quite a bit of access, um, just finding freely available materials that, um, that are quality and useful for all. And so if you click to the next slide, just here's a few examples of what things that are included. So uh, there are a number of useful um, units that have developed that are OER. And so we um, were able to bring these together in one place so that people don't have to try and shop everywhere to try and find what's available. 
Um, also found some great sites with videos that, um, again, freely available mat materials that connect to the standards. And then something else that we found, you'll note that my part of my title is content integration, that for science in particularly, there's really a need to have really good text related different articles, um, ebooks, and so forth. So we wanted to support that content integration piece by really bringing in um, those ELA components. So um, we have uh, connecting teachers with articles and passages related to the standard. Um, Nusala have been very useful for that and others. And then uh, Epic School also has, it's just such a good resource for picture books. So identifying useful books that teachers might either be reading to students or that students might read uh, themselves or with their families. Mm -hmm. And also found some, a few podcasts as well. So it was a wonderful exercise to find what, what resources are out there, um, what sites are there, and just connecting our grantees and our educators um, with resources to support them for teaching our students. All right, and um, I think I will pass it to Lori, I think. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. So um, I started this job uh, in the summer of 2022. Uh, my background was science and uh, NGSS and in, uh, high quality instruction materials. Um, and so when I came to Washington, I met with every single content area expert that we have at OSTI and I listened to teachers and a few things came to the forefront. One is teaching climate change is more than teaching the science standards that have the words climate change. Um, teaching climate change in K-5 is teaching science and teaching the social studies standards. Even if they don't say the words climate change, teaching what we have are the building blocks so that kids, when they do get to middle school and high school, and they are dealing with some of these really complicated ideas, they have those building blocks to be able to understand some of these really complex ideas. Um, the other thing I heard from teachers is um, <clears throat> there's not a lack of lessons about climate change or that they can incorporate. And we have amazing lessons from our climate time grantees um, and that OSPI has helped create it. So there's, there's lessons available and they were like, there's too many there. It's that decision fatigue, right? When you're looking at the, whether it's the resources we have on our website, or there's a lot of other great resources around climate change education available from NOAA or from some other uh, open resource uh, folks. Um, but they were like, well, how do, how, how do I do that? And I was like, all right, well, that's my jam. I can help make a planning guide. Um, I'm really good at that sort of tool. And so the first thing I did at OSPI was I, um, I wanted to ground this in, in what NOAA has at the time. So NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Education, right? The, the federal government. So they have this, um, this climate literacy framework that is, kind of old, it's uh, 2009. They're actually under, right now, it's in a process of um, being reviewed and, and re revised. So my tools will be updated as soon as that's happening. But with government shutdowns and everything, how the federal government works, it is not quite, open. I we were hoping it was gonna be open right now, but uh, hoping maybe December. So anyways, I took um, this uh, climate literacy framework and I went and I talked, again, I talked with every single content area and I, I looked to see where there were some connections. And so I have this draft because then we decided to go under a, a learning standard uh, review and revision. So I was like, well, I'm not gonna put more time into that if we're gonna change them all. But if you if you do click on that link, um, there, there are connections in every single content area. Um, and that was what everybody told me when I first started. I said, where does climate change fit? And every single content told me, well, it can fit almost anywhere. Um, and so uh, that, I was like, I just moved 2,000 miles. I can't just go, all right, guys, don't worry. I solved it. Climate change can fit anywhere. So if you go to the next slide. So what I did is I thought, okay, if I'm a teacher, how do I do this? How do I focus? Because climate change is such a huge topic. And there's so many different ways that you can go about it. And what's best practice is that teachers, when to incorporate climate change, you want to keep it, especially with our younger students, you want to keep it as local as possible. We really um, want to support teachers in what's important to their school community, what's important to their students, and help them plan their instruction around that. So I created, um, for individual teachers, a climate integration planning guide, which basically um, 
uh, steps them through, like, what standards are you trying to teach? Um, and then I, I, I link back to that climate literacy framework. And I'm like, pick a piece of this. Don't try to do it all. Because I think teachers want to try to do, right? I, I know teachers want to do it all, right? Because that's, they're amazing. And they work so hard, and they want to do everything. But you can't. And so how do we help them? Like, let's focus on one thing you can do. Like, what's one aspect of climate literacy, climate science literacy you can focus on? So helping them kind of step down, picking one piece, and then what instructional materials do you already have? Um, what other content areas could you work with? Different things. And it, so the, the planning tool kind of guides them. And I created the teacher guidance to basically be the the um, movie that's playing in my head as teachers are going through that, they can um, see different examples. Uh, there's some less like more like charts. So as teachers are filling out, they can see examples of kind of more what we're looking lo looking for, um, less examples of like what we're not looking for, right? We're not looking just to add the word climate. We're looking at making learning and contextualize of what's happening in their community. And then I also created um, a guide for teams of teachers. So my background is working with secondary teachers a lot. Um, and in secondary, um, you it's it's complicated on how to integrate and, and have um, teach students when they might not have the same teachers or every school is different, every school district is different. So it's, it's a lot harder, but I wanted to build um, a guide for teachers who wanted to try this, who wanted to integrate climate into um, with, or and partner with different teachers to support that learning. Because as we know, when students see the same thing from different teachers, they're more likely to remember it and kind of build from that. Uh, so I wanted to build um, some guidance for teachers to kind of do that. So it kind of mirrors the individual planning guide, um, but it just kind of gives teachers, again, that structure to help them go, okay, what does this actually look like in my classroom? How do I take one of the amazing resources that we already have um, and turn it into um, something I can actually do in my classroom, how I'm shifting my instruction in my classroom? And I think that's all I have. So I'm passing it to Kimberly. Great, so we thought we would just point out a few of the successes that we've seen by using our OER site. First is it's just been a really great platform. Sometimes it's difficult for us to disseminate things um, in useful ways using our own website. So um, the WA OER has really been just really um, helpful in just being able to get things to educators in a more timely um, and more accessible way, easy, easier to find things. Also, we've been just excited by the different, just this variety of resources we've seen our grantees um, being able to post there and our partners. Uh, we like, as uh, Lori shared, we've seen planning tools, we've seen lessons, we've seen units, we've even seen like professional learning modules. So, uh, so um, we appreciate the variety of, of resources that have been able to be shared uh, using uh, using this platform. Uh, we also just appreciate that it really is very validating for our partners to see their work um, put in a place where our educators can access and use them. So we really love that aspect of it. And then also appreciating that, you know, we have this grant funding um, and by having this way to disseminate it, it really allows for that, you know, the power of that little bit of money to really grow out to support like teachers and um, and partners all across our state. So appreciating uh, all of the very helpful outcomes of this project. And I'll pass it to our next person. Thank you. So we're about to watch a video um, produced in partnership with one of our state tribal education compact partnership uh, schools, Chief Leshi School. Um, they have received climb time funding to support um, and other funding too to support a really extensive um, natural resource, environmental careers, um, community centered, tribal value centered uh, curriculum. And a big link in that curriculum is getting students outside to do environmental restoration projects um, while they're also growing a salmon population in their very own salmon incubator. So we're gonna hear a little bit more about that. And we're so pleased that um, as part of a result of their work in climb time and because of their own values and their definitely their hard work and perseverance, this school has been recognized as a US Department of Education at Green Ribbon School for their progress in reducing environmental 
impact improving student and staff health and wellness and integrating environmental and sustainability education. So with that, we'll watch this video and I'll drop the link in the chat. Oops. I'm gonna have to uh, play the video. I'm not sure why it's not, uh... Google's not letting me jump to the video. <laughs> Hang on, there we go. We'll just do this. With Create Studio Pro, you can create No, we don't want create amazing an 3D character video. explainers just like Pic. There we go. My name is Bina McLeod. I am a Palop Travel member. My position here is the Director of Culture and Student Success. For us here at Chief Flesh High School, that is helping them to thrive academically, but also keeping a connection to who they are as Native children of Mother Earth. Today we're releasing some salmon, salmon that have grown up from little eggs for the Yalp River that ends up going to the Pisa Sound. And it's pretty cool that we're the ones who raise them up and release them just to catch them. And then they become so big. <laughs> I took a master's on biological science teaching and pretty much all of my learning was based on how to integrate traditional knowledge into a science curriculum that's primarily Western science based. We partner with the Puyallup Tribes Hatchery. We go and watch their salmon being spawned and we work with them just to see how we can fit our students into the roles that the hatchery has and needs and will need in the next 10, 20 years. They have a life that they live within their community. Then you have your westernized world where you have to go out and, and get a job and learn to survive in that world. So how do we get our students through the curriculum to understand that we have always been scientists, we have always been musicians, we have always been engineers, just by virtue of our lifestyle. I think it's important that our students be able to recognize that they come to the table with a wealth of knowledge and the key is for us is to help the students connect with what it is that they see to do something meaningful. So our encouragement would be not just to become a worker at fisheries, but become a biologist at fisheries. That's what I would want them to strive for, as you become that leader in that program, as your inherent right as a Pell Travel member. David My name is David Suela Cougar Duenas. I'm an alumni from Chief Lesh High Schools. I graduated in 2012 when I was a student here. We sang at the Tacoma Dome. One of our tribal elders, Nancy Shippentower, she had said that we're the salmon people. Now, today, we have all of our students and they're all singing these salmon songs. One of the things that is very important for me is that our students connect with whatever science that we're doing with culture first. Putting those pieces together is what this curriculum, the climb time curriculum is, is asking us to do, is to say, let's tie everything and all together in a way that speaks to our students. The chemistry class I created with another social studies teacher who is Indigenous is where we do the climb time curriculum and it's a civics climate science based curriculum so we bring in the cultural significance of salmon to the Puyallup people. Whenever we do such things that you witness we never do so without giving thanks. Giving thanks to the salmon, giving thanks to the water and giving thanks to all those uh, living things that sacrifice their lives so that we might live. Something that I was taught from, from my Lashutsi teacher is the Mother Earth, right? The Swatwift with the Earth is our caretaker. Like, we would not exist without the Earth. So we are to live in harmony and, and give our reverence. My teacher philosophy is to give them science that has a purpose. These kids, being Native, their voice is so loud that if they have the science to back it, if they know it's heard, they know what they're talking about, they can actually create change. Just never letting them forget where they come from. 
We are not part of Mother Nature. We are Mother Nature. Everything that is inside of our bodies is part of the earth. You know, our, our bloodstreams, the rivers, you know, our nervous system, the plant life, the rock system is our bones. And so it's not about just what do we know about the environment, but how do we save it? One simple but brilliant trick to heat. So one thing that we have found through our climb time work is that there is a, a strong sense of and desire um, for students to have support from um, adults in the room for taking action to solve environmental problems. And I think that comes through really strongly here um, and that we are we find in the standards, the social studies standards, the science standards, our state environmental sustainability education standards that um, we have the responsibility to make sure that we're providing these opportunities for our students to to take action and to be the voice of the change they wish to see in their communities um, through their own knowledge base that we're cultivating and supporting. Thanks. This me too. Sorry, I lost track of my slide deck. Oop, I think this one's Lori, but nope, this one's Elizabeth. Well, I can, nope. and then I'm the next one, but that's okay. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, y'all. I can go. So, um, a couple challenges we run into as we roll through the years of this project is, um, our our grantees see completion of ADA compliance rules as a barrier. So. One, helping them structure their learning materials from the get-go in a way that is um, easier to meet those compliance requirements, and then also giving them the technical support that they need or the training they need to be able to meet that requirement. Also, just supporting the idea that we're really um, aiming for iteration, that we want to change and grow our materials as we learn more. Um, and then helping them make those changes, encouraging them to actually get revised versions uploaded on the site. Um, and then really just providing that technical assistance again to get those materials successfully uploaded to the hub and sharing our best kept secret, the Washington hub of the OER Commons. The more people we tell about it, the more people we find out didn't know about it before, but they are very excited about the resources that are here and really eager to engage with the hub. All right, so a few lessons learned and where are we going with this, right? We're in year six, as Johanna said, um, how do we go forward? And so one lesson learned in that, at least I've been trying to say to myself a lot, is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Right. Um, so my background was in evaluating science instruction materials, and it was a very high bar. Um, and we really um, nicked um, the folks for every little thing. Um, but as I've grown, um, and, and, and especially in this work, right, we every lesson that our grantees work on and that teachers work on, there's there's always something that's really good that they put into that that we can focus on and we can share and we say this this lesson that was done by these grantees it has really good student talk moves it has really good structure around student discourse and it has some um, different ways that teachers can make sure that students are talking so really kind of focusing on like different parts of the lessons that we could really focus on um, and make Maybe it's not completely 100%, like would it earn the NGSS design badge? Maybe not, but it, it does have some good good parts. Um, so making sure that we, we're not um, waiting for perfect because we know that teachers want uh, materials down. The other thing that um, the ADA compliance, what Elizabeth just talked about, like that is a, is a huge hurdle that um, our grantees um, are, are working with and structure and that we're trying to figure out ourselves. And so one way we thought about that is if we had an ADA compliant template um, for designers to use, we know that 
Word um, does a lot of um, ADA compliance. So if we can have that, um, not everybody uses uh, Microsoft. So um, just making sure that we have some ways to help grantees. Um, the other thing that we've kind of uh, done this year is keeping track of what's actually in our OER comment. What, what do we have? Um, and then what's our, our um, what, what does that look like in the future? The grantees have grown so much in the past six years because we, we do professional learning with them. Um, at least uh, this year, um, it's every month we have in person or every month we have online. And then we have two in person. In the years past, they've had quite a few in person or all virtual depending on the year. Um, but they have looking back at what they, they, and they know this too, like looking back at what they made in 2018, they're like, oh, I would have done this so differently now because they have grown in their pedagogical skills. So how do we have a plan to address those so that we're not always creating new things, right? I don't know if we need uh, all new lessons, but can we revise the things that are on there? Um, and so oh, can we work together as a group of grantees and OSPI and all of our partners? Can we work together to figure out like what could be some paths forward? Um, so that's kind of where we're going um, towards. Uh, so again, we don't need a thousand new materials every every year. Can we work on um, revising some? Can we work on making some really good examples around some, some um, struggle points that teachers are having in their classroom? So student discourse, I know, is a huge one. Um, in integration in K-5 is a big one. So can we have some really good examples uh, for teachers and can we revise those? Uh, the other way we're kind of moving forward is by providing uh, multiple levels of support for our grantees. So as they're creating these resources, um, so like I just said, we have online sessions every month with them uh, that we just had one and we went over OER. Um, this month was, um, we went over um, um, different ways to get more engagement with our teachers. So we do different things. Um, so we have whole group sessions. Uh, we're going to do some optional sessions. So maybe on ADA compliance or um, importing things into OER Commons because that is is a process. Um, and some, if you don't use it every um, now and then, you might forget how to actually upload your resources. And then just providing individual support as our grantees need it um, so that they have the support they need um, to get their materials up there um, because it's, it's good stuff and we want to make sure that teachers see it uh, and are able to use it. And I think that's it for that slide. Thank you so much, Climb Time team. Uh, I learned so, so much. And uh, of course, I uh, want to congratulate this work uh, because it seems to have all the elements that that we urge other states and districts to take on from state level policy support of OER to you know districts doing the work, individual teachers gaining skills and um, having the content be so intentional and inclusive. So thank you for all the things that you've highlighted here. I'll just put it out to anyone um, else in the audience that may want to ask a question. So I actually have a question for my colleagues since uh, <laughs> we don't actually get to see each other in person all that often. So uh, Elizabeth, in the in the video, they mentioned the climb time curriculum. Is that uh, something that Chief Leshy like put together or is there a is there a resource out there that that is the climb time curriculum there there is not such a thing as the climb time curriculum i didn't um, think so but if there was i wanted to know about it <laughs> <laughs> i'll let jo johanna wants to say something and then i'll follow up yeah it, it is just a, a little bit of a misnomer and they, they did use climb time funding to structure amazing things for that class so yeah, sometimes people people write things. They're like, "This is our climb time curriculum," and so I think she was using it in that sense. Yes, it's the it was the district's climb time curriculum, and so what they were actually able to do with climb time funding is work through career and technical ed to develop several natural resource career pathways, so that now they have a highly diversified pathway option um, for or series of options for their students, including Indigenous culinary art and they have an indigenous culinary garden. 
Um, and then in elementary school, working with Open Sci Education Resources, which are also in the OER, um, to develop a, kind of a pathway for their fourth grade students to connect with um, field studies. So that's a little bit about what's happened and, and their, their naming of curriculum. <laughs> Well, can I ask you a little bit about reach? Because uh, as we as we all know, um, if we've been working in this movement a long time, K-12 educators still may not be aware of OER. And it's still uh, you know, um, a primary goal for the Go Open Network to spread that awareness. Uh, uh, like how many grantees um, are part of this work that are, you know, been able to do hands-on curriculum development or adaptation in Washington? I was I was looking at the number of contributors on our channel. I think we have more than a hundred contributors on our channel, and it's a comp. It's actually a complex answer. Um, so the number of grantees we have has varied over the number of years. We have all nine educational service districts as grantees. Many of them have individual projects where they subgrant or have contracts with other partners. And then we also have our, con or our grants with community-based organizations that operate at the state or regional level. And then each of those provides workshops for teachers on an individual level. So um, that's a great question about reach. Does anybody else want to add to what I had to say? You know, Elizabeth, I'll just throw out there because of the, the complexity of the environment, it makes tracking down the individual resources that have been created as a result of that funding um, challenging, which is why you find me asking questions like, wait, is there is there a is there a climb time curriculum out there? So yeah, I think that's just another challenge to add to the to the mix. Always hard to quantify. I see if Bridget has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you might have been about to answer it. I was going to ask if you had usage data to know when these um when the resources that you guys have been providing, because I think you've you've made several great points about sometimes it's not that we need more stuff, it's that we need to know that what we have is, you know, being constantly upgraded. And in in my opinion, I think that we need to know if it's being used. Um because it, you know, the, we, as, as a central office um, employee, that's one of the things that is often um, frustrating is, is we we continue to make these resources and if they're not being used, we have to know why. Um, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that it's just complete defiance. I just want to know, like, what is it that that's the sticking point? So I wondered if you guys had any kind of data about usage implementation of these type of resources. So I can take a crack at that and then I'll, I'll, I'll open that up to others as well. We do get some information from uh, from ISKME and OER Commons uh, with regard to kind of how many visits there are to a site, how many times it's been saved into different groups. Um, but that just kind of scratches the surface because as you know, with OER, folks are encouraged to take it and distribute it. And once um, we lose touch of that, we do lose touch a little bit with, you know, exactly how far it's been spread. Um, I will say that the resource that uh, Kimberly mentioned, the NGSS K-5 guide, was probably one of the most widely accessed resources uh, that we tracked last year. Um, and I'm, I am hoping, and Amy, maybe you can speak to this a little bit, but I, I know that uh, ISKME and OER Commons is aware that as states, <laughs> we, we desperately need this information to secure future funding and, and to just, um, you know, have some evidence for our, our communication and awareness. So I, I know that they're aware of that and I, I think that they're working on that, um, but. I don't know if you have any more info, Amy. I don't have I don't have the latest info. Uh, they're always working on it because it is critical, um, uh, and very hard to count, as you mentioned. Once it goes out of the system, uh, another critical part of OER our OER awareness and mindset and practice is putting it back in the system after you've made changes to it. Uh, so. Um, I, I couldn't tell you any more about um, 
the the tool specifically, but I am just really excited about the work that you're doing to lift up teacher skills and the professional learning you're doing around making things um, geographically localized or culturally responsive. And I wonder if any any resources come to mind that really have been adapted in those ways. I'll just add in that um, I think being culturally responsive is a big part of our climb time work. So, and our partners tend to be very, very cognizant of that. So I think that ought, that, that naturally flows into the things that they're creating. Um, I'll just uh, add a note about the, just what you were talking about just before, Barbara, if I may, that, so the resource you mentioned, so I had almost 1200 people have viewed it. But it, I, it's because I used it purposely in concert with professional learning that I was doing to others. And so finding a way to like, like, you know, advertising the professional learning, getting teachers there, connecting them, getting them into the resource, having them go and poke around. Um, it, I think it's that's why that was able to just disseminate that more more widely. I'll just add a footnote to my questions about um the cultural responsiveness, because it, it seems like an important part of your work is remediating bias. And uh, ISKME has done some professional learning on remediating bias with OER, and, and particularly with climate resources. They One of the examples they've used was a US Forest Service resource that had it would have been improved if it ha had included indigenous names for place names, for instance, or had been um, localized for certain geographic settings for teachers to, you know, to include uh, their local creeks and forests and lakes and things like that. So we we do bring teachers into that kind of practice and um, just wondering if is that something that you also are doing when you're when you're showing the practices of OER is um, that kind of adaptation because you have so many great resources as you mentioned when they're say for instance localized they can become even more useful for folks. Yeah, I will say that some of the the grant funds that we uh, distribute um, and and. Speaking just grant terms in general, I know that my OER grants that go out um, will often take existing resources and then adapt them for a localized context. I can think of um, uh, something called Drum Beats in Time that was done that had taken some of the um, the Since Time Immemorial, which is our tribal sovereignty curriculum, which is uh, focused more on our our Western uh, indigenous people, uh, Western part of the state, I should say. Um, and they uh, they changed and adapted it to meet the needs of the, the local tribe near their area. Um, I know that some of our uh, Districts in Eastern Washington are doing the same thing to uh, to contextualize it for the Spokane tribe or for other tribes that are in their region. So, yeah, that work is certainly being encouraged and supported wherever possible. That's yeah. great. So I see we're out of time. Did you all get to put up the slide just before this with the climb time links? You might have skipped over that. Yeah. This is all of our contact information. Yeah. So please, right. please reach out if you have any questions. And I believe, Amy, you put that one pager into the, the chat window. Thank I you very did. much. Yes. And, and it's in our, our that shared has, folder. That has links to all of the resources that we mentioned and all of the, the, the video links and just general information. So yeah, okay. please, as folks have questions, reach out. Okay, we'll go back to the, the last slide. I just really want to thank you so much, the Climb Time OSPI team, all your uh, amazing work that you've been doing over six years to support OER and, and to support climate learning in K-12. Uh, you're, uh, as usual, Washington is way out in front, uh, leading the way. 
with OER and open educational practice. So uh, thank you so much for everything that you've shared. Great examples. And uh, this will be closing out the year. I'll um, maybe stop the recording, but I see Bridget has her hand up and uh, we can continue if you all can stay on for a minute.